Sorry for the bother. The thing is, I... He began. The moment I learned the truth, I was filled with surprise, gratitude toward my father-in-law, and a sense of liberation. My name is Charlotte. Born in April, surrounded by the gentle scent of blossoming flowers, as my name suggests. Since then, 45 years have passed. I've devoted my life to my family as a wife and a mother, cherishing each day. But problems arose outside of my family life. I used to spend joyful times with my family alone. I met my husband Joseph at a club in college. We hit it off, started dating, and eventually got married. We have a son, but he's working in the city as a professional, so he only returns home once every six months. Ever since it became just the two of us, Joseph and I looked forward to revisiting places we went when we first dated. How about going to Six Flags tomorrow on our day off? Now here's the question. What did Charlotte do 23 years ago at that amusement park? Eh? Did I do something? Caught off guard by Joseph's sudden question, my mind raced to remember. Something from that long ago? Oh, I remember. After riding the teacups, I got dizzy and fell into a nearby pond. That's correct. I was so embarrassed I wanted to pretend I didn't know you. How mean! Why did you let go of my hand then? Laughing about my embarrassing moments like this has become a treasured pastime. Even when it's just the two of us at home, the atmosphere never darkens. We lived a happy life. Due to Joseph's shift work, there were days we hardly saw each other. But since I adjusted my work to match his schedule, I rarely felt lonely. However, then a major event that would drastically affect our lives happened. Our father-in-law was diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer. Surgery was difficult and the five-year survival rate was less than 2%. A dire illness. Both Joseph and I were filled with such hatred, our hands clenched into fists. When a loved one suddenly falls ill, you wonder what you can do, what's the best course of action, and your mind goes blank. Joseph has a sister living in the neighboring town, but she doesn't know about this yet. Deciding to inform her soon, Joseph picked up his smartphone and made a call. After seven rings, a loud, shrill voice echoed through the receiver. Why are you calling now of all times? I'm busy preparing dinner. We have something important to talk about. We'll come over tomorrow evening. Despite her complaints about the sudden development, this wasn't the time to worry about such things. After conveying the necessary information, Joseph hung up. Joseph normally didn't pay much mind to his free-spirited sister-in-law, who rarely shows up at family gatherings and doesn't quite mesh well with his personality. But this time, things were different. The next day, we hastily took the day off and headed to her house. When we rang the doorbell, her husband, not the friendliest of individuals, was the first to answer. He opened the door without changing his expression and looked at us with an intimidating stare. Not a pleasant feeling. In the living room, she cast a cold glance at us. Despite not having seen each other for six months, she treated us worse than strangers. Amidst this, Joseph fixed his intense gaze on her. Then, as he informed her about their father's illness, she uttered unbelievable words from her mouth. So what? You came all the way here to say that? The sickness is dad's fault. Don't tell me you came here expecting me to take care of him. Instead of expressing sadness about her father's illness, she seemed more concerned about avoiding any inconvenience to herself. It was my first time seeing a daughter look down on her father, who didn't choose to get sick, and I felt embarrassed for her as a fellow human being. My anger peaked, and even my parents, who had planned to talk calmly, were getting worn down. That's too much. You're his daughter, aren't you? Even though a loved one is suffering, you can be so indifferent? If the roles were reversed, you would definitely be upset. I thought she would reflect a bit on what I said and quiet down, but I underestimated her. Don't talk nonsense. There's no rule that says I have to look after him because I'm his daughter. If you're so concerned about it, why don't you do it? Joseph is his child, just like I am. Indeed, my husband Joseph is also father-in-law's child, and it's not right to put the responsibility on sister-in-law alone. Because she's so irresponsible, I thought she should step up and take care of father-in-law at a time like this. But people like her are good at justifying their behavior. What she said wasn't wrong, and I figured it was futile to argue any further, so I dropped it. Although we were reluctant to leave father-in-law to sister-in-law, who clearly didn't want to deal with this, 
We, as a working couple, didn't have the time, unlike sister-in-law, who was a housewife. If Joseph had to quit his job, it would be better for our finances if I quit mine, but I found fulfillment in my current job. As I was considering my options, sister-in-law revealed her trump card with a triumphant look on her face. By the way, Charlotte, you have a nursing certification, don't you? You know more than an amateur like me. I think you should be the one to take care of him. It's reassuring for the patient to have a professional take care of them, isn't it? I had worked as a CNA in a nursing home 15 years ago, having earned a nursing certification so that I could take care of my parents if something happened, since I'm an only child. Knowing it would be futile to pursue sister-in-law any further, we decided to go home and think things over. I'm sorry you have such an unfeeling and troublesome sister-in-law. She's not the type to reflect on herself, even if I said something, so I couldn't say anything. No, it's okay. I knew that no matter what you said, it wouldn't change anything. It's not your fault, Joseph. What should we do? I can tell you love your job, and I would feel bad taking that away from you just because my dad got sick. But even in a situation like this, it made me happy to see Joseph thinking so much about me. But unlike sister-in-law, I'm not heartless. I wanted to cherish every minute of father-in-law's life. It's okay, don't worry about me. I can figure out my job situation later. The most important thing is I met you, thanks to your dad, so I want to express my gratitude. Holding Joseph's hand, I saw his eyes welling up with regret. Let's face this together. Seeing Joseph's expression lighten a bit, I geared up to tackle the bigger problem. The biggest issue here is money, isn't it? While chatting with Joseph, it turned out that my father-in-law had only signed up for the cheapest insurance available. That meant the guaranteed expenses would be minimal, and we'd have to pay out of pocket for necessities. Well, his daughters definitely won't offer to chip in, he said. And they should be contributing more if they're not going to help take care of him. Their lack of dependability was disheartening, even though I hadn't expected much to begin with. Caring for a sick person requires mustering up your own motivation when it's at rock bottom. It's not an easy task. It was a battle against myself. The next day, I decided to step away from my work in the bar kitchen, where I'd enjoyed the camaraderie and hard work alongside the younger staff. When I explained the situation, everyone was understanding, though their disappointment at my leaving was palpable. Please come back when you can, they said. Those words gave me strength and became my motivation for what lay ahead. With that, I headed straight to the hospital where father-in-law was waiting. Arriving at the hospital, I saw father-in-law from behind, quietly facing away from the entrance. I couldn't tell if he was staring out the window or sleeping, but his loneliness and sadness were palpable, and I couldn't find the words to speak just yet. After about 30 seconds, I took a deep breath and walked closer to father-in-law. As I tried to figure out what to say and how to say it, father-in-law spoke first. Charlotte, thank you for coming. I'm sorry to be such a burden. His face softened as he greeted me, but quickly his eyes filled with worry and his expression darkened. He was so considerate despite his illness, and it angered me that his own daughter, sister-in-law, couldn't bother to be here. Please let me know if there's anything I can do for you. I knew I couldn't understand the pain of his illness, but I wanted to support him as best as I could. Once I'd finished my morning chores, I'd take a 40-minute journey to the hospital each day. I'd always driven to work, but now I opted for the bus to maximize my time with father-in-law, even if it meant cutting into my sleep. The bus rides were soothing, providing a brief respite and rejuvenation for the challenging days ahead. As I watched father-in-law's vitality diminish day by day, I devoted my heart and energy to making him comfortable. The medical procedures, including IVs and medication, were necessary, but not simple. Unlike a routine IV for a cold, a catheter had to be placed near his heart via a surgical incision below his collarbone. The sight was distressing, but it was the best we could do for a father-in-law who wasn't a candidate for surgery. Try this! I offered, handing him a Walkman. Father-in-law loved karaoke and had even won local competitions with his amazing voice. He used to practice daily by singing along to his CD player, but his hospitalization had put an end to that. Wanting him to keep his passion for music alive, I loaded his favorite songs onto the Walkman as a gift. He immediately put on the headphones and pressed play. His face instantly brightened. 
I thought I wouldn't be able to listen to music anymore. Thank you so much. Now I have to win another karaoke competition when I get discharged. Seeing father-in-law smile, I felt a bit relieved. Even amidst the unfamiliar hospital atmosphere and daily tough treatment, father-in-law never complained. In fact, he was more worried about me. Sorry for causing you trouble and expenses. I wish we had traveled more with you and Joseph. I've always wanted to go to that place. Then, he took out his mobile phone and showed me a picture. There, countless lavender flowers were blooming in all directions. Wow, that's beautiful. This place used to be nothing but fields. But after urban development, it turned into such a beautiful spot. This flower is my favorite. Seeing father-in-law's eyes sparkling, I wanted him to get better even more urgently. From then on, I decided to stop by a florist before going to the hospital for father-in-law, who loved flowers. After you left, I felt lonely, but having flowers around changes things. I found myself talking to the flowers, and the nurses looked at me like I was strange. We had a good laugh over this. Two weeks later, a feeding tube was attached to father-in-law, who had been eating normally until then. You could visibly see his body turning more yellow. His voice, calling my name, lost its energy. I had to suppress my fear and act strong, which was tough. I hadn't expected him to become bedridden in just two weeks after the cancer diagnosis. I was painfully aware of the dreadfulness of the disease. I wanted to say, stay strong, dad, but I knew he would be the most frustrated. He probably didn't want to admit that he was weak and would be blaming his body for not listening to him. His smile, showing strength at times, was a saving grace for me. I would often excuse myself to the restroom, unable to hold back my tears. I'd wash my face with cold water to cool my flushed face, and then return to his room. Joseph also spent some quality father-son time with him, during his breaks or on his days off. I would enjoy some quiet time alone at a cafe in the hospital during those moments. Father-in-law, who was always kind to me, seemed even happier when talking with his son. So, I decided to give them as much time together as possible. An hour later, when I returned to the room, the two were discussing insurance money. I want my modest insurance money to go to Charlotte, who's taking great care of me. Father-in-law said, turning towards me. He had changed the beneficiary to ensure that I would get the money in case something happened to him. That's when the hospital room door flung open with a bang, and sister-in-law stormed in, hurling abuse. I heard your conversation! Why did you change the beneficiary to her? It used to be me! Change it back, immediately, or I'll spread the word that you're the worst father ever! Both Joseph and I couldn't believe the childish words she was saying. However, to our surprise, father-in-law defended sister-in-law. Alright, I got it. If you feel so strongly about it, I'll change the beneficiary back to you. But in return, promise me you'll stop saying hurtful things to Charlotte. She's the wife of my beloved son, Joseph. I won't tolerate her getting hurt, no matter what happens. Perhaps sister-in-law really loved money, to the point of obsessing over it. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that's all she thought about. Once the father-in-law said that, the sister-in-law nodded quietly and left the hospital room. I wanted to follow her out of disbelief, but was stopped by my husband and the father-in-law. So, I reluctantly sat down on a chair in the room. However, I couldn't help but notice something off about their behaviors, leaving me with a big question mark floating in my mind. Hey, why are you guys laughing? In response to my question, my father-in-law began to explain the truth between chuckles. That silly girl really believed all my assets were tied up in insurance and went home. Your plan worked well, Dad. Then my father-in-law took out three bank cards from a locked drawer and handed them to me. He told me they held a fortune beyond my wildest imagination, which left me speechless with surprise. I knew the father-in-law was wealthy, but a new question popped up in my mind. Why was he only enrolled in a single, minimal insurance plan? However, it was a decent plan. That would give him $10 million in the event of his death. All my assets are on these cards. I know I don't have much time left, so I want you two to use it. I'm sorry for all the expenses I put you through, with my hospital bills, flowers, and clothes. No, no, the money we spent isn't a big deal at all. 
We can't accept such a huge sum. It would feel like a punishment. Just take it as a token of gratitude for taking care of me. And remember, keep this a secret from her. It seemed that just like us, the father-in-law didn't think highly of the sister-in-law due to her selfish behavior and lack of family consideration. That's why we had decided to leave her only the bare minimum if anything happened to him. Won't you accept my offer? Faced with their earnest gazes, I found it hard to refuse. I felt guilty, but agreed, nonetheless. Two weeks later, in accordance with the father-in-law's wish to spend his remaining time in a more home-like environment, receiving palliative care, we moved him to a hospice. We contacted the sister-in-law just in case, but her only response was a curt, good for you. It was truly an eye-rolling moment. Despite the sister-in-law's absence, the warm conversation between the three of us continued. I'm sorry for causing you trouble with my secret, but there's one more thing. Did you know my father was Martino Aaron? What? You mean the famous singer? I've seen him on the hit Nostalgia song show. Are you serious? That's news to me. This was big news. Even Joseph didn't know. Apparently, it was not public knowledge that the father-in-law was Martino Aaron's son. He was a secret child, and because Martino Aaron was a public figure, it was kept under wraps. However, Martino Aaron apparently doted on the father-in-law behind the scenes and shared his wealth with him before he passed away. When I'm gone, go here. Saying that, the father-in-law handed us a piece of paper. It only had an address written on it, and we had no idea what it was about. He kept evading our questions for more details. A month later, after living his final days at the hospice, the father-in-law peacefully passed away. Father-in-law, I sobbed, calling for him one more time, but there was no answer. Gratitude welled up in me for how he had always treated me like his own daughter, and tears streamed down my face like a waterfall. As we stood by father-in-law's side, leaning on Joseph for support, we watched the doctor and nurses do their work. At the funeral, sister-in-law arrived and began crying loudly. A stark contrast to the attitude she had shown us previously. She was talking to the attendees as though she cared deeply for her father. I wanted to tell everyone that all sister-in-law wanted was money, but doing so wouldn't make father-in-law happy. So I decided to think of sister-in-law as a stranger, which somewhat eased my mind. Of course, after the funeral, sister-in-law didn't interfere with us, and we didn't bother with her either. A week after father-in-law's passing, Joseph and I headed to the location written on the piece of paper father-in-law had given us. The sight that met us was astonishing. What is this? Both Joseph's and my voices overlapped. Before us stood an enormous, opulent mansion like nothing we'd ever seen before. Unsure of how to proceed, we decided to walk around the vast gardens first. A woman emerged from the house and I was so surprised I fell backwards. I I'm sorry, I didn't think anyone was here. The woman in front of us wore a kind smile as she invited us into the house. The interior was so extravagant, with marble, diamonds, and ornate decorations. It felt like we had stepped into a dream. The woman guided us to a room with plush chairs where we sat down. Um... As I hurried to understand the reality of the situation, the woman began to speak slowly. I've been the caretaker of this house. Your father owned this place and used it to entertain his friends from time to time. Every time someone would visit, I would come to assist. However, there's no longer a need for me to come here. Your father's final wish was to hand over the ownership of this house to you, Joseph and Charlotte. After saying this, she handed us a set of keys, a map of the house, and a notebook detailing the location of various valuables. She added, I'm glad to have met the people your father treasured the most. I wish you happiness. After these words, she left. Two hours of investigating later, we found a letter from father-in-law in a desk drawer in the study. The letter stated that we could live in or sell the house as we wished. There was no way for us to express our gratitude to father-in-law, who left us not only a fortune, but also this grand mansion, as he was no longer with us. 
All we could do was continue living in this world, for father-in-law's sake. The following month, we decided to go to a hotel father-in-law had wanted to visit for 15 years. On our way, we played father-in-law's favorite music and spoke to a photo of him. Father-in-law, we're finally going on a trip together! Let's have a blast today, I said. Suddenly, a leaf fell and stuck to our car window, shaking lightly. It felt like father-in-law had answered us, which made me happy. Three hours later, we arrived at the historic hotel father-in-law had spoken of, nestled in a quiet spot surrounded by peaceful nature. Photos of several past presidents adorned the walls of the hotel, signifying its recognition and importance. After we were shown to our spacious room, we sat down on the sofa, savoring the welcome drinks and fresh fruits. It's been a while since we've been able to enjoy a leisurely trip like this. Yeah, well, Dad's with us today. It had been a long time since Joseph and I had shared a look, and I couldn't help but feel a bit embarrassed. After enjoying the spa and exploring the hotel, it was finally time for the meal we were looking forward to. Since we had ordered meals for three, the room service staff who brought it to our room was quite surprised. When we explained the situation, they nodded in understanding, with a kind smile. After talking about my father-in-law for a while, they even offered us a bottle of wine on the house. Mmm, this is delicious! Just what dad would say, I mused. Being an infrequent drinker, I got tipsy that day, until my memory blurred. However, my husband Joseph, who was good with alcohol, remembered my actions and told me about them the next morning. Last night, you kept stroking Dad's picture and saying, I love you. I can count on one hand the number of times you've said that to me. I was a bit envious of Dad, he said, laughing. We shared this humorous anecdote as we drove along a different route than the day before. Oh, here! There, lavender was blooming as far as the eye could see. There was no mistake, this was the place my father-in-law had shown us in the photo. Embraced by the gentleness of the lavender color, I felt invigorated, not just entrapped in sadness, but eager to face forward. Dad told me once that Mom used to gaze at the lavender a lot before she passed away. Realizing that my father-in-law had brought us here out of love for his wife touched my heart deeply. Since then, we've started bringing lavender to the grave. The lavender has become a precious flower for our family, warming our hearts and bodies. Once we returned to our normal lives, we started spending our weekends in the luxurious house my father-in-law left us. Thanks to this, every week felt like a vacation. My love for Joseph deepened, and my gratitude to my father-in-law overflowed. I can't count how many times I wet my clothes with tears of joy. Fast forward a month later. It was a weekday around 7 p.m. After Joseph came home and took a bath, I was preparing dinner when the doorbell rang. When I checked the monitor, I saw my sister-in-law. She rarely comes to our house. I wanted to pretend we weren't home, but with Joseph's car in the driveway and the lights on, that wasn't possible. As I was hesitating, the impatient sister-in-law began to pound on the door. Worried about the neighbor's eyes, I turned off the stove and hurried to the door. As soon as I opened the door, my sister-in-law started yelling before the door fully closed. Where the hell are you two on the weekend? It seems she came to our house over the weekend, but Joseph and I were not there. I couldn't tell her why, so I remained silent, while she glared at me threateningly. All right, all right, come this way. I didn't want her lingering at the front door, so I led her to the living room, intending to let Joseph handle her. Just then, Joseph, fresh from his bath, came to the entrance, and I sighed in relief. This, what brings you here around dinner time? I appreciated Joseph's forthright approach as I watched the two of them. He led her to the living room, and the conversation continued. I came to light incense for Dad at the family altar over the weekend, but you two were nowhere to be found. Her self-righteous tone still irked me. Then, out of the blue, Joseph dropped a bombshell. I actually spend my weekends dating Charlotte, trying to pass on all the love that Dad gave me. Sorry if this doesn't sit well with you. A sister who has to deal with her husband being lovey-dovey with another woman. My voice and sister-in-law's overlapped in shock. 
What? Sister-in-law was visibly shaken by this unexpected revelation. There's no way! What are you talking about? There's no way he could be interested in any other woman but me! Immediately after, Joseph took out his mobile phone from his pocket and showed a picture to sister-in-law. Curiosity peaked. I peeked at the photo and sure enough, it was sister-in-law's husband arm in arm with another woman. Sister-in-law's fury and sadness reached a peak and she seemed to stop caring about me and Joseph. As soon as she got the picture forwarded from Joseph, she stormed off. The next day and the day after, when I asked Joseph, who didn't talk about sister-in-law, what happened to the couple, he said he didn't know because he had blocked sister-in-law's contact. I don't consider her a sibling anymore. All I want is to live a peaceful daily life with you. Fast forward a month. While out shopping with Joseph as usual, we bumped into a neighbor from where sister-in-law lives. Apparently, the sister-in-law couple was in the midst of divorce discussions, with the husband completely out of love with sister-in-law and a reluctant sister-in-law still not wanting to split, despite the infidelity. As much as it sounds like a tough situation, I've decided to stop worrying about sister-in-law and just focus on living my own life. As long as I have Joseph, I have nothing to fear. Father-in-law always used to say, the key to happiness is to laugh a lot and sing out loud. I'm going to go back to my old job soon, but I plan on adhering to father-in-law's advice and enjoying life to the fullest, even for father-in-law's sake. Joseph and I both love to sing, and we've promised to participate in a karaoke competition together. Our goal? To make it to the same podium that father-in-law did, to reach the top. As we let our singing voices resonate towards the heavens,